I want to thank Josh and the choir for all that you have given us today and will continue to share and guide us today. Um, a special thanks for this particular hymn to sing. Um, many of you have heard me say through the years, it was actually the last words that Dr. King ever spoke um, as he was standing on the balcony at the Lorraine Hotel. He was asked by the musician down in the parking lot what he would like to have sung that night. And he said, please sing, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. He said, no one sings it better. And a shot rang out, and his life was gone. So this is what I always think of as our final gift to him, to thank him for his presence in our lives. Listen for the word of God today that comes to us from the Gospel of John beginning in the first chapter of the 43rd verse. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael to become his apostles and continues to build his base for ministry in John's gospel. For the young Samuel, God's call to follow comes in the heat of the night. Each of us receive a call from God to follow in one form or another. For some, it comes at birth and it is witnessed by those who welcome us, newborn, into the world. That is exactly what happened with Howard Thurman. The call of Howard Washington Thurman to follow Jesus was mystical and pure in its origins. On the day he was born in West Palm Beach, Florida, on November 18, 1899, Howard Washington Thurman was actually wrapped in a thin membrane called a call, C-A-U-L. This call covered his head and his body and was seen in his family as a sign that this was God's mysterious blessing to them, to the world. That's how it was seen in the African-American community of his origin. His name meant guardian of my people and he was to live into the calling of his name. From birth through early childhood, Howard Thurman was unique in all the world. A grandson of a slave experienced the world around him in mystical, mysterious ways. As he grew through adolescence and into early adulthood, he integrated his African-American Christian heritage with his own mystical experiences as a child and youth and developed a very distinctive interfaith 
interracial, pragmatic, syncretistic, authentic, nonviolent, social gospel witness for justice and peace. Thurman was an original. He was an original thinker. He was an original prayer. Thurman's original thinking and daring authentic example prove and provide for us vivid proof that the words of Acts are always true. God has never been left without a witness in doing good. Those who heard Dr. Thurman preach and teach at Morehouse College, at Howard University's Rankin Chapel, in the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples in San Francisco, which he founded in 1944 as the first interracial, intercultural church in America. So this is 1944. On one hand, you say, that's really early. On the other hand, you go, we've been around a long time to finally get to this point, right? There they were at the Marsh Chapel in Boston University, or a myriad of local places who would report how mesmerizing his deep, resonant voice was, and his even deeper spirit was even more mesmerizing. Churches welcomed him for extended visits for teaching and preaching, and they would report that they all slowed down and they got quiet in the head and the heart. Wow. In 1936, Dr. Thurman was the leader of a group of four African Americans who made a pilgrimage to meet Mahatma Gandhi in India, and thereafter was the initial person responsible for bringing Gandhian nonviolence back to America as a methodolog methodology for social change. Gandhi said to Thurman as he was leaving India, it will be through black Americans that the unadulterated message of nonviolence will be delivered to the world. And Dr. Thurman was the bearer of that. For countless leaders of the civil rights movement, Howard Thurman served as a mentor, advisor, and spiritual counsel. He was Martin Luther King's teacher and mentor at Boston University when, as was pointed out earlier, Dr. King was doing his PhD. That was very good, I like that. It has been reported by biographers and friends that King carried this book. Actually, it would have been this volume, 1949, edition of Jesus and the Disinherited, wherever he went after launching and leading the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. Preachers would flock to hear Thurman preach, and leading theologians would appraise his impact as unquestioningly the most original and invaluable, powerful voice. The, the late Reverend Dr. James Cohn, often called the father of black theology at Union Theological Seminary in New York, described Howard Thurman as the most original theological mind ever to arise on American soil. Enthusiasts from interfaith work endeavored to understand him and came to study with him for generations. As an introvert, Thurman never sought the limelight. He would sometimes be in hiding, or as Jesus would say, praying in the wilderness, right? He was a revolutionary thinker who firmly believed humanity possesses an inherent potential reverence, and he viewed Jesus as the premier guide and connector to God for us. To Jesus, he wrote, God breathed through him all that is. The defining motif of, think of Thurman's thinking was his incessant search for the common good and a perpetual listening for what he called the sound of the genuine. Astoundingly, his overall vision was of this, that we live in a friendly world underneath friendly skies. Imagine that, the grandson of a slave growing up in the oppression that he experienced in Florida in the beauty of all of this, he said, in the beauty, anguish, and unallied faithfulness of Negro spirituals, you will find the greatest expression of humanity, the most profound expression of God. Thurman understood forgiveness to be manifested when there is an awareness of having done violence to the integrity of the soul and to the sense of goodness and righteousness which became manifest along our journey. For him, the God of life is the God of religion and not the other way around. 
Thurman's views on prayer were varied and dynamic. He defined prayer as a way of connecting with God's divine agenda on the working paper, which is what he referred to as the Bible. And the main way to find a clue to God's purposes in the world was through prayer. The openness of the human heart in prayer was for Thurman the swinging door that no one can shut. Ultimately, Dr. Thurman believed and operated under consistent assumption and commitment. All human beings could be made successful for the journey when they connect with God in their lives of the inward sea. And I'll read this to you. Please return to this, however you can find it, and read it for yourselves again. Such journeys and such intimate connections are what save us, he said, within the earthen domains that we hold and on into eternity. And here it is. There is in every one of us an inward sea. In that sea, there is an island. And on that island, there is a temple. And in that temple, there is an altar. And on that altar burns a flame. Each one of us, whether we bow our knee at the altar, external to ourselves or not, is committed to the journey that will lead him to the exploration of his inward sea. To locate his inward island, to find that temple, and to meet at the altar in that temple the God of his life. Before that altar, impurities of life are burned away. Before that altar, all the deepest intent of your spirit stands naked and revealed. Before that altar, you hear the voice of God giving lift to your spirit, forgiveness for your sins, renewal of your commitment. And as you leave that altar within your temple, on that island, in your inward sea, all the world becomes different. And you know that whatever awaits you, nothing that life can do to you will destroy you. Again, that's something you need to revisit. It's worth it. You and I, you're probably wondering why I'm talking about Herman, the Thurman on Martin Luther King's Day. I'm getting to that. You and I and all who will enter this church for generations to come have been and will be blessed and influenced by Howard Washington Thurman. It was Thurman who deeply influenced another one of God's beloved originals, who was called to create beauty in this world. Her name is Ellen, the artist who designed and created the music window of First Church, dedicated to Denny Bernard in 2003, and the social justice window last year, which was placed in the narthex just four weeks ago, but sort of lost in the joy of Christmas for most of us. It looks out onto the social justice park, and the social justice park looks into our cathedral of grace through the window, clear, clear glass. This week, I asked Ellen to share some thoughts on her window. I also recommend that all of you go to the First Church Arts website and listen to the interview that Melissa Colwicky did with Ellen some time ago. But hear Ellen's thoughts and the connections to Thurman and all of us. She writes, first my thoughts on Howard Thurman. I think he would be so sad to see the state of our country. What once seemed so promising in terms of civil rights has been so diminished by SCOTUS. And almost half the country thinks we should have minority rule by religious zealots, fanatics, and frauds. He lived through the rise of fascism and white supremacy in our country and in the world. And here we are. Just look at the state of our country and government, the third anniversary of the insurrection, a Confederate flag carried through our capital that day, and only boots have been responsible, not the suits. I hope that the windows remind people that justice costs us and to never give up looking for it. I do love the window, she continues. Its vibrancy, its movement, along with the excitement of working with the history of social justice. All our conversations and research came together without the need for a didactic visual approach. It does leave open so many possibilities for learning and conversation. I also got to use glass 
that I had saved over the course of my lifetime just for the right project. And here it was, becoming the bookend, knowing it completes the church narthex and possibly my career in stained glass. The details make the window come alive. There's a whole lot of symbolism packed in a little bit of space, and I will tell you, it's our littlest window. It help, it's like the train that wants to be, you know, that goes up, the, you know, goes up the cliff. It just keeps going. Anyway, I especially am holding Denny in my heart today, she said. Professor Thurman loved music. He wanted to make music. He wrote, the gift of intimacy is revealed by the magic music creates when a person who is so blessed makes an instrument sing. Yes. The window has the notation, this is the highway of the Lord. This comes from the end of the chapter on hate in Jesus and the Disinherited. Drawing from one of his poems in the greatest of these, he states, hatred tends to dry up the springs of creative thought in the life of the hater, so that his resourcefulness becomes completely focused on the negative aspects of his environment. He closes his chapter on hate with these words, Jesus rejected hate. It was not because he lacked vitality or strength. It was not because he lacked incentive. Jesus rejected hatred because he saw that hatred meant death to the mind, death to the spirit, death to communion with his father. He affirmed life, and hatred was the great denier of life. To him, Thurman writes, thou must not make division Thy mind, heart, soul, and strength must ever search to find by, the, by which road you will go. To all men's needs thee must go. This is the highway of the Lord. Ellen finished with these words. Professor Thurman speaks of the paradox of human adventure. We all live inside this experience, but we are permitted to bear witness only to the outside of it, he said. Today, the fight for justice continues, and his legacy now more than ever needs to stay front and center. And it's my hope, she writes, that the window continues to be a focus and inspiration to fight fear and move towards the light. Two geniuses come together in one window. In 1 Samuel 3, we hear the voice of God calling Samuel in the night. The young Samuel is confused, but the old Eli is not. He knows it is God at work calling his young prophet. He knows it's God who's calling him to step up and answer. He knows it's God. Just as Philip and Nathaniel know it's God, as they're drawn to Jesus, Samuel's called in the dark of the night, and Howard wrapped in call, that mystical membrane of protection was set loose into the world to create beauty and social change through mystery and prayer and nonviolence. And Martin, was born 95 years ago tomorrow, was anointed by God to save the soul of our nation, a phrase he used in his first speech to the people of Montgomery. We are here to save the soul of the nation. And Ellen was anointed by the Spirit of God to create two windows of sacred music, of sacred beauty. One for music, dedicated to the work of Johann Sebastian Bach, and one for social justice, dedicated to the inspiration of Howard Thurman. So every one of us needs to ask ourselves, what is God calling me to do and be? What is God calling me to do and how am I supposed to be moving on the highway of our Lord? As you ponder these thoughts, receive these words that send you out today. Words from Howard Thurman. He said, do not ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go and do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So my friends, come alive and step forward.
onto the highway of our Lord.